Hey, welcome everyone to the MIT Mobility Forum curated by the MIT Mobility Initiative. I'm John Movenzade, Executive Director of the MIT Mobility Initiative. Today we have a very special session because our regular host, Jinhua Zhao, is actually our guest today. And he has brought with him several uh, students uh, working on important projects. Uh, so I'm going to play Jinhua's role as host today. So before I formally introduce Jinhua, just a reminder of our norms, camera on, voice off, and we ask that you contribute at least one idea or question to the chat. In fact, our, our guests find this the chat feed really, really interesting and helpful, and, and they do look at it after these uh, Friday sessions. Um, now, just to get a sense of who's on the call, if you could all take a moment just to type in your location and your organization uh, into the chat so we can get a sense of where we are all coming from. So we see London, Purdue, Singapore. Oh my gosh, uh, Hong Kong, Hebrew University, Chicago, Montreal. Ann Arbor, Toronto, Belgium, Buenos Aires, Vienna. Wow, okay. That is quite a diversity. Okay, well, let me go and introduce uh, Jinhua Zhao, who is the Edward and Joyce Lindy Associate Professor of City and Transportation Planning at MIT. Jinhua integrates behavioral and computational thinking to decarbonize the global mobility system. He's the founder and faculty director of the MIT Mobility Initiative, which coalesced the Institute's efforts on transportation research, education, entrepreneurship, and engagement. Jinhua also directs the JTL Urban Mobility Lab and the Transit Lab at MIT. He leads long-term collaborations with transportation authorities and operators in cities ranging from London to New York to Hong Kong. Jinhua researches and develops methods to sense, predict, nudge, and regulate travel behavior and designs multimodal mobility systems that integrate autonomous and new modes of mobility with public transportation. He's the co-founder and chief scientist of Tram Global, which is a mobility decarbonization venture. And finally, I should say, Jinhua is the nicest guy in the world, a tremendous pleasure to work with, and you shouldn't be surprised if he gives you a hug when you meet him in person. Jinhua, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, John, such a kind introduction there. And uh, uh, hello, everybody. So excited to be the speaker today. So I titled my talk as AI and the Public Transit. I want to mention that this really a collective work with a large group of uh, people working with me for many years. I want to name uh, Professor Shenghao Wang, Professor Harris Kusopoulos, Professor Nigel Wilson, and a whole group of students uh, working with us on this. Today, actually, I invited six of the students to join me co-present, right? Uh, first, I want to clarify uh, one thing, what the talk is not about. Right. Uh, today, there's so much discussion on the large language model, so much discussion on even the sparks of artificial general intelligence. Even the spark, the fact that we can discuss AGI in the really scientific way itself is really almost uh, alarmingly powerful. Right. So along with it, the impact on the jobs, the impact on education, the, the disinformation and fate of democracy, even the existential threat to human species, right? These are such important topics that uh, in the future session, we'll have a designated discussion on these topics, uh, but today we will not uh, talk about those areas. If you do interest in these uh, uh, topics, I recommend first this book called Alignment Problem by Brian Christian, really talk about how do you align the human value together with the capacity of human machine learning and artificial intelligence in general. Secondly, Professor Stuart Russell have been really the, the, the leader in this thinking of how do you make sure the AI is compatible with the human judgment of human values. And lastly, if you're interested in this more philosophical discussion, I recommend the Yura Harari's book on Homo Deus, right? That being said, today's topic is more mundane, talk about specific public transit, operation, planning, and strategy, 
So here, what are the transit uh, analytical functions, right? If you start from this transit analytic end of the core, think I go either up the offline functions that lead to the service uh, planning, operation planning, which is a change supply, or to the right, you do this land use, employment, urban activities that which then change demand, right? So from both the supply or demand side, now we have this automatic data collection system from AVL system, automated vehicle location to the automatic fare collection system, automatic passenger coming system to bring this information from supply and demand to the core of the transit analysis. And then more and more, the field moving into a more real-time uh, functions, including the real-time service control, service management that changes supply on the fly, or real-time customer information that can inform and guide the passengers better. That's a real-time customer information back to the demand, right? So that's the general picture. Now the question is how AI in general can hopefully enhance uh, or improve several of these functions there, right? So at our lab, we'll focus on three areas. One is the behavior understanding, then which then drive the performance analysis and then from our side on the decision support. This actually cuts through uh, both the operational functions, tactical functions, and the strategic functions of transit system there. Okay. Uh, I want to mention one thing, that, uh, that's the first point. The second point is that uh, public transit in the United States has much bigger issues than what AI can address, right? So I don't really don't want to claim that AI can solve everything. And far from that, there's a very limited contribution AI is making now. Hopefully future can make more contribution. I want to acknowledge that uh, there's a broader set of issues out there, right? Today we'll focus on more narrowly defined view of AI and its contribution here. So specifically to the left, I put the three, this is a classic, classic classification methodology point of view on supervised learning, supervised learning, and reinforced learning. How does that impact different functions of transportation? For example, the first one is the distributed analysis. We have prior student Gabriel Goulet look at how transit data can be used to really segment the customer in the effective way. Then on the supervised learning, we're doing many of this research on aggregated demand prediction that led by Paymount, and later, uh, on the individualized pr demand prediction, really at the each individual passenger level, can you predict the next trip? Uh, innovated using this actual language model, Ngram model, which indeed is one initial component of later large, large language model called Ngram. That's Jan Zhao, uh, who is now professor at Hong Kong University, uh, as well as Bai Chuan Mo, who uh, in, innovated on this input output hidden market model. He's worked for, for Lyft now. And the third one, that's the synergy between this discrete choice model and different neural network model. I really want to ha highlight that uh, uh, Dr. Shen Hao Wang, who was uh, a lot of this lab, uh, now is Professor Shen Hao Wang work at University of Florida, really innovated in this area, how to bring the, the classic discrete choice model together with the different neural network model to enhance the predictability, right? The last one is on the reinforcement learning. For that, Joseph Rodriguez, uh, together with Professor Harris Kusoblas and myself, who are working on uh, how do you use reinforcement learning to really improve the operational control, right? That's the three categories. To the right, we also look at uh, text mining, computer vision, causal inference, general AI, et cetera. So today I'll try to bring a flavor of all this uh, different research. So the style of today's presentation is not an in-depth discussion. Instead, it's kind of a survey of many of these topics. Now, uh, how do you position this, right? Put this into two dimensions. One dimension is uh, this vertical one between the structured data and unstructured data. For a long time, transit agency were able to use this uh, typical relational database base, the table format, numerical data. But more and more, we are able to digest, say, for example, language data, uh, in the sense of uh, incident logs or, or customer feedback or computer uh, uh, vision or images. So this is one, one dimension. The other dimension is uh, in terms of the uh, time horizon of a decision making, either from short term, decision making to the long-term decision making. And you can position the different uh, uh, research into different this quadrant here, right? So for now, let me bring the whole team up. Uh, Boy, if you don't mind help spotlight all the, uh, all the student here. Uh, today we'll give you uh, really a fly through of, of the different type of uh, research, right? I put them into uh, uh, four zones. The first one is on demand prediction. We call this a deep hybrid model. The first one, Qing Yi Wang will present on the urban imagery for demand analysis, transit demand analysis. And the second one, uh, Ding Yi Zhuang will describe the graph embedded urban new road network use that to predict the, the trend in ridership. Then zone two will be on the modern modern trend side, broadly defined, where uh, Dr. Awad Abd uh, Ali will present the computer vision application for public transit travel time prediction. And Michael Liang will present 
the work with Umata on natural language model for trying the customer feedback intelligence. Then zone three is on control. Joseph Rodriguez will talk about the deep, deep reinforced learning for real-time time control. And lastly, we want to um, uh, uh, include the discussion on the ethics, particularly the algorithm fairness in the public trend demand prediction. For that, well, Yunhai and Zheng will present, right? So that's my introduction. Now is the show of the students. So I am glad to present the, the collection of MIT Trans Lab talent here. So I'll we'll give it the first one to Tingyi. Go ahead. Hi, thanks, Zheng Wang. So my talk will be on deep learning and um, urban imagery for demand analysis. Thanks, Chris. So deep learning has undoubtedly, undoubtedly become increasingly popular in the field of demand analysis. However, existing work sits primarily on numerical data with some modest performance improvements. And considering the successful deep learning applications such as Dali Midjourney and uh, the even more famous chat GPT, which what really sets them apart is not marginally improving model performance, but making the progress from zero to one on the ability to process unstructured data. And in recent years, there are actually quite a few papers that suggest that images are predictive of sociodemographic properties. And what's missing here is the fusion of images and sociodemographics. This is important because we believe that the data sources are complementary in nature. And to demonstrate this point, deep habit models are designed. Next one. Conceptually, deep habit model has a crossing structure. Horizontally, a deep learning mo model is used to encode the unstructured data. And in this case, we use an autoencoder. Vertically, the sociodemographics are integrated into the deep learning model, forming a latent space that contains both sources of information. And then the latent space is uh, used to predict the travel behavior. So next one, this is a model performance on three different behavioral indicators. The y-axis is r squared value, and each different color bars represent only sociodemographics, only imagery, and deep habit models, respectively. And we have auto, active, and public transport. We see that only imagery and only sociodemographics r squared is above zero and our deep hybrid models can outperform both. Thanks to the latent space, which connects all the model comp components, we could also develop economic interpretation of existing and generated images. In this diagram, only S and C are real images, which represent South and Central part of Chicago. The other images are generated by feeding a linear combination of the latent spaces of S and C into the decoder. On the image side, we could clearly see a transition from S to C, getting denser and then going beyond. We could also calculate the mode choice changes corresponding to the imagery change, which is presented above the images. For example, the auto usage drops when moving towards the downtown area with an increase in both public uh, transit and active modes. The more smaller figures below show other economic quantities we could develop. Next one. In fact, the latent space is flexible such that we could not only move between two images, we could mix an arbitrary number of images and observe the sociodemographic and the travel behavior implications. So this is a 2D illustration with the, we add another real image N representing North Chicago, and then the uh, mode choice changes are presented on the right. So Great. I hope I have convinced you that deep hybrid model is an innovative modeling approach that opens up many possibilities in demand analysis. And we'll be introducing another application incorporating road networks in the next section. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you, Ching. Uh, Ding, go ahead. Thanks. This is Ding Yi. So my work is an extension for Qingyi's work using a, a urban network. Oh, it's our input. Next slide, please. So you can see that uh, from this flow chart, you can see uh, our input changed to the row network G. And right now we're using the graph embedding instead of the image uh, computer vision. So we still learn the latent space um, integrated with numerical data like such as demographics. Right now we we do not have the uh, generation part, but we are focusing more on the choice model to um, to regress on the travel behavior. So the graph embedding can learn the representation of the neural network into a more uh, low dimensional Euclidean space. And this whole process actually uh, actually came free from us from the feature engineering and prior knowledge and assumptions on the urban road network, like the um, density, um, device uh, diversity, etc. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, our case study is using the uh, input data from Chicago, in uh, recording the road topology and travel distance. Apart from that, we also choose one year of social demographic information. So our test, I will show you how it uh, will benefit to uh, regress the public transit mode share and also income per capita. Next slide, please. So what can this latent space do? Actually, you can learn um, if we look into like three of our uh, learned 128 dimension of latent space, you can see. The first of three actually represent a very different perspective of the social demographic correlations. Uh, next slide, please. So if we aggregate them in a spatial level, you can see uh, um, the method one is in the aggregated graph embedding readouts. 
and the right one is a, is a um, um, public transit mode share distribution. You can see that there's a very strong spatial insights and correlation between these two. Next slide, please. And if we saw them, uh, so this um, aggregated living space values, you can see that from a small quantile to a larger one, you can see in the transition that um, represented a real network structure. Um, yeah, the, the quantile means the, the value of the green value results and the upper row is, is uh, correlated, uh, I mean, the corresponding row structures. You can see the transition it transits from a sparser, irregular, and non-irregular, uh, non-rectangular shapes into a denser, organized, and more graded counterpart. Next slide, please. And we go back to our regression performance. We use uh, training and testing split of our 30 and 30% of the sensor tracks. Um, both our baseline models and our proposed model use a simple linear regression for the choice model, but our inputs are different. For the baseline model, we use the um, previous uh, very classic feature, feature, uh, feature engineering way. And for ours, we just only use our graph embedding vectors. You can see that from the right-hand side tables, it both uh, on count of the both in-sample and all-out sample r squares, or improvement are all uh, near or larger than 30% percentage. Yeah. Great, thank you, Dingyi. Now let's make move to the second block on monitoring. or we'll invite uh, AWA to start with the computer vision discussion. Perfect. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm all the I'll be presenting on computer vision for transit travel time prediction. If you can go to the next slide, please, you know. Um, so this is a very familiar problem for everybody. You get to the bus stop, you see that your bus is arriving at some time, and the arrival time just keeps on changing um, because of the, you know, transit is mixed with the other traffic that we really have no idea um, how to estimate the, the impact of that on travel time. And if we go to the next slide, um, we did this case study on this site in Mass Ave, um, here next to MIT, where we have access to both the AVL data from the um, MBTA, as well as access to our roadside camera. So the, the gist of this project was, if we move to the next slide, um, is to look at into integrating um, the vehicle data, the AVL data and the travel time data into annotating images. So integrating those different data sources that we have the advantage of in transit work uh, for creating an end-to-end -end, um, framework for labeling images to predict travel time. If you go to the next slide, um, the, big structure looks something like this. So we have three different data sources of real-time GTFS, a camera for image acquisition, and ABL data for limiting, um, for labeling, sorry, and annotation of data. Uh, we train a vision transformer model to make those end-to-end -end predictions. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is an example of what we can see doing this. So after collecting extensive data, you can see at some normal conditions, rain, snow, or night, we see that the model starts to learn different features that help it deduce the underlying traffic state and hence create some anchor states um, that improve travel time prediction. Um, you can see that it's really doing sensible things as learning that you know vehicle locations and queues at certain places affect the expected travel time um, and things like at night when it can read the traffic signal that also impacts the estimation of travel time. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, we have different metrics of this. You can look at the preprint for more information, but what we can see here is the prediction from images into some predicted travel time discretized range as an anchor. And um, we can see that, you know, there's four different states of travel time. Uh, and we can see that by time, the model looks at enough images and starts to learn that those images map into certain expected um, travel time ranges um, that if we go to the next slide, um, we can use as an additional attribute. So if we compare here, just a very generic linear regression model that uses the time of day and historical data and direction of travel to anticipate travel time. It's not the most accurate if you can see the actual the predicted travel time on the axis. And this is what you're getting um, on your, you know, constantly changing travel time estimation uh, on the trip planner. Uh, but here, when we use those attributes, those anchor attributes that we get from images as an additional state estimator, we can see that this significantly improved the prediction ability of even a simple linear regression model. So we'll definitely look into more sophisticated models as we grow this project. Uh, and this is not the one uh, you know, application where we see integrating traffic data and images, transit data and images as something that leads into a functional um, application, but there are other cases, you know, bus lane enforcement, the time that people spend on platforms and how that can be used to model and improve the estimation of dwell time and such as really potentially good applications for vision um, in transit applications. Um, and I'll pass it on to Michael to speak uh, on the language side of things. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Michael, please. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to be presenting on a project that we very recently started with Omada to understand the how natural language models can be used to understand customer feedback uh, intelligence. The main crux of the problem on the next slide that we see is that in the current case, 
all the feedback data that comes from the web, from social media, from traditional comment cards, websites, even phone calls comes in unstructured text. Uh, right now it's at most agencies, it's uh, manually processed because it comes. In, it's it's um, the rates it comes in is, is is still able to be processed by humans. But the result of this that is difficult to discern these areas of concerted trends over time because we're looking at uh, everything together. If we want to really gain a lot of intelligence, then um, in the next case, next next slide. Uh, we see that in an aspirational case, we want to be able to try to quantify this data statistics and automate a lot of these processes. So I'll give you an example on the next slide. We have two tweets, public information. Um, and how, how should we try to um, label this data to, quant to quantify it? Well, I tried. And you can detect a lot of things, actually. You can have the mode, bus, specific route, stops, time, sentiments. Even You can even look at the gender based on the username or, or whoever submits the, the comments. Right, but to do this at scale, that's when we are using the next slide. Um, to, to do this classification task at scale, that's when we have to look at using uh, different types of language models. On the left side, there's a distinction between unigram and gram models that are actually good enough to, to identify very, very specific things like a line or a mode or a route uh, or someone's name. And on the right side, we have mass language models that are meant, it's a neural network uh, architecture to predict context aware words from uh, neighboring words. And we, to actually uncover meaning for the words for things like sentiment, sarcasm, and one thing that we were actually really able to do was we were able to train an in-house model to classify any tweet or any complaint into 10 very broad categories, very relevant to transit agencies, operations, customer service, cleanliness, and whatever not. Then we go to analysis and then we see that um, once we're able to get these dimensions, then we can analyze over time what happens, right? So this is complaints about operations on the red line and really two angles. So on the left, we have proactive monitoring. When do we sound the alarm? For example, in this picture, it's when the amount of complaints goes over the moving 90th percentile. But then we can also look long term at trends and policy analysis. For example, you kind of see a trend there. It's actually relatively stable, except there was a bump during COVID, mainly because this is complaints per million riders. So ridership went down and the ratio went up. On the next slide, we have an example of the questions we can ask for this. For example, did a deep cleaning initiative last year lead to less complaints about cleanliness? Well, listen, uh, if you plot the um, if you plot the negative complaints about cleanliness per million metro routers over time, then you can see the significance of the effect. And it depends on how many months you look back and forth. On the next slide, you can also agglomerate them by bus routes and um, by bus routes. And then we can look at from here. If you imagine this as a dash board you need to be able to select what routes and you can either bring up all the complaints or we can ask our friend chat gpt what do the complaints say and you can see that on the next slide uh, we can even we can summarize well what are the main causes of the complaints what are the in, and what are the impacts the customers and even what do the customers suggest what Mata needs to do uh, the last two dimensions in particular are ones that we can only uncover after looking at feedback so how can to sum this up and to zoom out how can we um, use the unstructured data to improve transit operations. Really, um, what, what I'm really optimistic about is being able to combine existing measures that are absolute and numerical, like frequency, accessibility, whatever not, with, with future measures that are more abstract, uh, perceptual, emotional, to really lead, to lead us towards more responsive operations, responsive planning um, to co contribute to the richness of all this data. With that, uh, kind of back to Thank you, Michael. Yeah. So let's move to the zone three, uh, where Joseph would describe the reinforcer learning based real time bus control just as a context uh, uh, we are working with us uh, uh, department of energy on this topic of a transit central smart mobility look at specifically how machine learning can enable a better design and a more energy efficient system for that uh, uh, professor shen hao wang professor Hai Mustafa, and myself is leading this now we'll give it to uh, joseph to actually talk about one of the component please Thanks, Jinhua. So hi, everyone. I'll be talking about how we applied reinforcement learning to improve bus service reliability. Next, please. For a bit of context, so the problem of uh, bus routes that operate at a high frequency and uh, in mixed traffic is that they're subject or have a strong tendency to bunch, and which is what you see in the photo and the diagram to the right. Next, please. And the problem with that is it makes bus service unreliable, overcrowded, and requires riders to over budget travel times. Now, there are some strategies you can implement to correct for this, like bus holding and stop skipping. And you can make use of several criteria that can be decision rules, optimization, or even reinforcement learning, which this research uh, focuses on. Next, please. So 
to give you a, a sense of, of what the problem looks like, on the left, you see kind of a bus line, a lot of buses. And this is a unique type of control system because you can only make those control interventions at a specific time and location, right? Only when a, a bus passes by a certain checkpoint. And so this doesn't fit well with the centralized control framework, but rather more intuitively on the centralized control. And the the proposed approach is to, uh, to a certain extent, uh, centralize the training um, by sharing information between agents that are close by and can affect each other. Next slide, please. And how we do that, you can see a snapshot on the right of the of a control step, and you, you focus on the trip in the middle that when it arrives at a checkpoint, it selects an action, which is going to be evaluated, evaluated only when uh, the experience of the riders using trip I or trip I plus one have, has materialized. And so in that way, you expand the scope of the reward. And in the, in, in the rest of the ensemble and the environment model, we support this uh, kind of expansion. Next. Now, we have uh, trained the model and tested it in simulation. And we have also actually applied a simplified version of this um, to an actual in an actual field experiment in Chicago. So we took the re reinforcement learning recommendations to adjust the departures of a, a bus route in the north of Chicago, bus route 81, over one week. Next slide, please. We've looked at the performance in, in terms of metrics that are of interest to many stakeholders, like riders, drivers, agencies, and cities. And the improvements we see are, for example, for riders, excess waiting time was reduced significantly. And um, uh, things like crowding and cycle times, and as well as uh, linking back to the Department of Energy uh, grant or project, we have computed the mobility energy productivity score for the area of this uh, bus line, and we have observed a significant improvement in that in that sense as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Joseph. I just want to add one word of uh, thank you to our colleagues, Chicago Transit Authority. They really offered a systematic support throughout the institution uh, for Joseph and our team to really implement this IL-based uh, idea. So it changed from just be being an uh, idea in the simulation to actually on the ground seeing the impact in practice. Uh, so next, we'll move to the last module on algorithm fairness by Yunhai. Thanks, Jinghua. So as a background information, machine learning has been widely adopted in many applications. Um, however, many recent studies have found that the machine learning model can produce unfair predictions against the disadvantaged populations. So in this study, we want to investigate whether the fairness issues also exist in child behavior predictions, and if so, how to mitigate them. Next slide, please. So one widely used criteria for machine learning, uh, for fairness in machine learning is equality of opportunity, which requires that the predicted outcomes such as child behavior indicators should not be influenced by sensitive attributes, given that the actual outcome is positive. So to achieve equality of opportunity, it is crucial to ensure that there is a minimum difference in the rate of false negatives between two social groups. Next slide, please. So our study shows that the fairness issue widely exists in child behavior prediction models, whether using binary logistic regression or deep neural networks. So the two graphs here show the disparities in false negative rates between racial groups when using the binary logistic model and deep neural networks. As shown on the left figure, significant differences in false negative rates exist between ethnic minority and majority groups when predicting frequent usage of various travel modes using the binary logistic regressions. And the graph on the right shows that although the adoption of deep neural network has considerably reduced prediction errors, fairness disparities still exist with similar signs of disparities as observed in the logistic regression model, except for biking. So after acknowledging the prevalence of prediction disparities among different social groups, we implemented an absolute correlation regularization method to mitigate the prediction bias. So we incorporated a regularization term into the standard cross entropy loss function uh, during model training. So this regularization term basically penalizes the correlation between the predicted outcome and the sensitive variable Z given the true outcome. And the hyperparameter lambda here controls the trade-off between accuracy loss and fairness loss. Next slide, please. So here we show the results of applying the bias mitigation method to the predictions in terms of both fairness and accuracy. The graph on the left illustrates the impact of increasing the regularization weight on prediction disparities. And two lines here are training downwards, which shows that our method is effective to mitigate the prediction disparities for both binary logistic regression and deep neural network. 
However, the graph on the right indicates that as the bias mitigation weight increases, the model's accuracy also decreases, which shows that the improvement of fairness comes with a cost, and there is an inherent accuracy fairness trade-off when mitigating prediction bias. Okay, so I'll turn it over to you, Jinghua. Thank you, Yinghua. So hopefully that that's a, give you a flavor of all the research that's ongoing in the lab. Uh, last, I'll just say a few words about some of the the, the future project that we are uh, contemplating. Uh, here's a few examples. The first one is really introduce the form of causal analysis empowered by the machine learning. Uh, for that, you know, I actually working on some example of that. Second one is using the generative AI in the urban images for us to be able to really uh, uh, realize the imagining the uh, cities or transportation system. And also we have some work on the future of jobs in public transit, how the definition of a job of being a bus driver will evolve over time, given the different societal trend. And lastly, it's on the multi-channel view of cities. I will just give the last, uh, a flavor of the last uh, point here. I want to mention that uh, 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 this is, Shenghua Wang is the thought leader on this. We've been, dis Shenghua, we've been discussing this idea of uh, how do we really describe cities, right? If you look at uh, MIT as an institution, you will find at least 10 different disciplines all claim cities are their research subject. we will give a few examples. So if you have more designer, design oriented, say architecture, say I study cities, urban design study cities, and for this type of a discipline, what's their data, what's their uh, uh, tool of vocabulary, we use images, right? Then also the another type, uh, if I'm an urban historian, I'm a sociologist, I use language, I write books about cities, right? So my vocabulary is a natural language. And then if you are economists, you probably use mostly numeric data using statistics to describe the city. Well, if you're a transportation person or many other, you use graphs, you will build your uh, real networks. You can see that different disciplines, they all study cities, but they really have a different style and they have a different vocabulary to describe things, right? What I end up is uh, when we try to interact with each other, we kind of, we do not have a coherent foundation and we often talk to over each other. Right, so this is what uh, Shenghao has been giving the analogy on. This really applies to uh, this allegory of the cave, right? We only see one particular projection of the city given your perspective. Like look at uh, Chicago example, you may look at the numerically the population, the auto ownership. Uh, the, in the graph, you can look at the transit network. And if you look at the image, you can, it, it, as a design perspective, or you can look at the natural language from the books or Wikipedia, et cetera, right? So now the question is, is it possible for bring them together? For example, in a typical prediction setting, uh, let's say prediction ownership, you have this certain X as an independent. So it's prevented to owning a car is a function of a whole set of numerical variables, right? But can we generalize the idea to include new numbers, images, languages, and graphs, all as a meaningful input to this exercise, right? So DNN seems to provide a potential unifying framework to process this uh, uh, multi-channel view of cities. But hopefully we can get to the degree that we have several dimensions that all can look at the, 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 the city as an object so that the discipline can really talk to each other in a deeper connected way in this. Uh, what the Ding Yi and, uh, and the Qing Yi presented is some flavor of this, uh, how to incorporate images, how to incorporate uh, uh, graphic network, uh, real networks, how to uh, incorporate languages into this. Now that time that has been isolated, right? But the goal is, uh, can we actually put this together as a unified form of this, right? So this is uh, what we present. And then last of to mention that uh, we're just starting a project with uh, Singapore, really more fundamental look at how AI will empower people, institution, and city that hopefully can address the initial question that I raised at the beginning, go beyond the public transit. All right, thank you everybody. I'll now pass form back to Jiang. Thanks so much, Jinwa. Look, before we get into the specific questions, I, I would like to just pose a question to, to you, Jinwa, which is, you know, we have a number of folks on this, on this uh, forum that are not public transit professionals. Um, and I, I wonder, in the work that you've been doing in the transit lab, and you think about, you know, these advances in AI and machine learning and so forth, what is it that the non-transit professionals need to understand? Uh, what are the observations that you have in working directly with some of the public transit agencies around the world? Uh, like, will we really see this future where AI can, for example, enable predictive analytics so that the system can truly be more responsive to 
the, you know, the living demand patterns of a city. I mean, to put it very simply, if, if, if I head to a basketball game at the um, TD Garden and there's just no train available coming out of that to, you know, to, to head back, you know, we know that. We know that these basketball games are taking place. Do we actually see a, a future where that sort of analytics is really incorporated into public transportation networks? What, what observations do you have to share? Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, John. This, this is a, a brilliant question there. Uh, first of all, I also want to uh, mention that uh, I invite uh, Shenghao Wang and Anson Stewart to offer some comments. I, I can try to answer this question first, but I like also Shenghao and Anson to add some broader comments to the whole set of presentation today, right? Back to John's question here. First of all, thing, uh, transit exists for two arguments. One is a density argument, the other one is equity argument, right? The density argument is saying that uh, given a high density urban development, transit is the only form of transportation that can enable such a high throughput and therefore enable productivity and uh, urban creativity in that. The second one is an equity argument, right? That to say that for certain group of people, for many of them, public transit is their lifeline for mobility there, right? So both roles are important here. Another important thing I want to say, I, at the beginning I mentioned that the state of public transit in the United States now has a much bigger problem than what AI can address here, right? Uh, if we couldn't have bus drivers around the train, around the bus, if our signal system is falling apart, it doesn't matter how our AI fantastic thing we're doing here, right? We're of course looking at a more, this is analytical part. Hopefully several of the examples we plan can make this uh, uh, a specific contribution to improve prediction, improve monitoring, improve the customer experience, improve the control. Right, but how the system will work together? Can we have a meaningful, uh, both political support and a financial support and operation support? That's clearly beyond what AI can do there, right? But that's a great question on that. So, uh, uh, Shenkao and Anzai, if you're here, I'd like to invite you to add some thoughts as well. All right, thank you, Jinghua. I could go first. So okay. I just want to provide some general discussion we have for all the presentations and students just present. Um, based on my observation, I could see actually three tensions um, in this AI and plus public uh, transit uh, research. The first one is really the tension between computer science and all the other domains. Because as we see that like deep learning and AI is permeating into all the other domains, then people just start a question whether the other domains have the independent like academic values. And actually, through those deep hybrid models, we do provide one answer, which is uh, we should create a more positive dynamics and uh, adopt a more synergetic perspective, and then try to not only adopt some AI technology and apply them into a specific domain, but have the like backward feedback, uh, like using the domain knowledge to enhance as uh, AI the specific models. So that's pointing to the actual motivation underlying uh, 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 Qingyi and the Dingyi's work. And the second tension um, is actually from Joseph's work. That's the tension between state of the art and the state of practice. So because Joseph actually in his work, he really developed a state of the art, deep room for learning for the transit control. But when we really implement that technology in, uh, in, in Chicago, we kind of intentionally keep the gap. We cannot like use the most advanced technology, but really simplify that and then implement um, that technology to create a more robust workflow and then demonstrate the social impacts. We believe that gap between state of the art and the state of practice is a healthy and desirable gap. Gap, we, we, we need to protect that. And the third one, the third tension is actually between the, between the private and the public sectors. Remember the public, uh, public transit is really a public sector. So when you think about the application of AI technology, you know, now most of the technology is still just uh, like maximize the prediction accuracy. That's a simple like single object organization, which can be easily adopted in private sector in which the pro profit usually is a single objective. But whenever we go to a public sectors, the objective become more complicated. It's not only just a profit, but the many, many other um, aspects like equity, uh, fairness, um, also like a basic accessibility. So we believe that recent trends in AI, I like talk about the ethical aspects, um, transparency, interoperability, and fairness um, for the AI technology is really important, especially in terms of the application of AI in public transit. So that's the fundamental uh, uh, motivation for Yunhan's work. Thanks, Xiao. 
uh, Einstein? Let me briefly offer some uh, observations in response to John's question, Jinhua's response, and I think uh, Jay's question in the chat about kind of adoption at public transit. I think uh, there are some interesting applications, especially at the intersection of what we've called zones two and three in today's uh, schedule. And Jinhua mentioned the severe workforce shortage that transit agencies are facing, you know, not being able to run 20% or 30% of the trips because the drivers aren't there or quit or aren't being hired quickly enough. But also on the dispatch side, um, we're lacking dispatchers. That's a, especially acute here in Boston, causing uh, trains to be run at much lower frequencies. So how do we break that cycle? Uh, how do we make it less stressful for dispatchers? How do we let them do their jobs more effectively um, to, to mitigate some of the short-term problems we're facing? Uh, I agree with Jinhua. AI is not going to solve the fundamental problems facing public transit. But I think there are substantial opportunities to mitigate some of the acute issues. So what would that look like for operational control and dispatch to, to mitigate some of this proportion? I could be giving dispatchers alerts, right? Uh, what are the top three things they could do, you know, a, in a given period of time to improve service for the most amount of people? Uh, it could be kind of suggestions, alerts. I think these would also incorporate the unintended consequences that control actions might have. So dispatchers, especially newer dispatchers, uh, people dispatching buses or trains, might be pretty reluctant to make any sort of service intervention because there could be unintended consequences and there is a lot of underlying unstructured complexity in terms of labor rules, downstream effects, network effects, et cetera. So I think uh, there is great potential here for AI instead of needing you know, two decades of on-the-job learning for a dispatcher to feel comfortable making a recommendation, uh, there's an opportunity here for, for AI and ML-based tools to kind of do that learning quickly and then offer recommendations for dispatch actions. So I'm excited to see some of those applications um, and I look forward to hearing other people's reactions to this. Super, okay, that's very helpful context. Uh, I'm going to turn over to Bhuvan right now to uh, take us through some of the questions in the chat. Hey, sorry, I was just adding myself to the spotlight. Uh, thank you, guys. This has been also our largest forum. We've hit four. We've crossed 450 attendees. So uh, great job, uh, great presentations, all. And you've made my job tougher by answering a few of the questions in the chat. So I've been struggling to keep track of what has been answered already and what has not been answered. But uh, let us give this a shot. So a couple of the questions, you know, were general questions related to the applications of AI in public transit. Uh, a couple of the questions, you know, were very, very uh, specific to a particular project, which most of you all uh, seem to have, uh, I think, uh, covered in your project. So, I, so, so there was one question, I think, to Avad on the bus uh, travel time flexibility project. Uh, so Brian Bonner asked if, uh, you know, the, the, with the increasing, uh, uh, you know, battery electric buses coming into the fleets across various transit agencies. Uh, so was, uh, is, was that considered as one of the inputs in your model and how, how may this affect, you know, the travel time prediction and reliability for uh, the model that you had developed? Yeah, this is this is a very good question. I tried to answer part of it uh, in the chat, but um, I think it's also more important the other way around, honestly. So what we looked at in this project is what does the overall, you know, state of traffic look like and how that maps into predicting travel time and not the not the impact of the exact type of bus on that, because the bus is just a component of that. Uh, but I think to, to the point, I think when it comes to electric buses, it's the reliable travel time prediction that we're talking about now is more from giving reliable real-time information to passengers, updating it with what we can see, right? Seeing the traffic. Uh, but I think for battery electric buses, it becomes even more important than just giving reliable real-time information because you, you plan blocks based on that. You have your run times based on that. It's much more impactful when you're talking about batteries. Uh, when we talk about things like the anticipated traffic state and how that affects the starting and stopping, that has a huge impact on regenerative charging for electric buses. Um, so I think the impact would be more on how can we reliably, you know, model traffic state or estimate traffic state from images to help us plan for buses. And then, you know, maybe there is a role that when the bus is electric, travel time is affected, but it's definitely affected more by the general state of traffic. Okay, uh, thank you. 
So there was another question actually on electric buses from Sunil Nair from the MTA New York. Uh, so this was more a general question. So Genoa, feel free to uh, you know add in. Uh, so based on his question was more that is there any work being done on including AI for predicting the performance of battery electric buses, you know, tracking each, you know, the state of health of each cell, uh, you know, when does it need to be charged when, you know, what, what is the, uh, the state of the bus, uh, how, how much can it run, things like that. So uh, is there any research being that done in that space to use AI to, you know, uh, get the maximum range, get the maximum, you know, service and turn around minimum turnaround time for electric buses? Sure. Yeah. Thank, thank you. So there, there are uh, multiple stages AI could apply in the whole kind of a, a, a supply chain of this process. For example, using AI to fine tune the battery control system, right? That's clearly area literature work on this, right? I think more the operation side, one thing I want to, to introduce is so far, because often the, the battery based bus cannot travel as long as the diesel one in one charge, right? So therefore, Sometimes uh, many agencies have to prioritize the electric bus deployment in the, uh, uh, the bus lines that have a short turnaround. So you can, you can go in this one chart, right? But then when we get to the stage where we, we electrify at scale, then we'll talk about all the lines need to be uh, electrified. What this means is uh, the transit planning process, like a vehicle scheduling, crew scheduling process versus the charting process can no longer be thought of as a segmented, as an isolated process, right? You have to integrate the two. That's the area I think with a lot of the, like a current literature is going on to this, right? Combining the optimal charting problem, also together with this, your garage design, your battery design, these type of things, along with your vehicle scheduling and crew scheduling process, there is a much complex either optimization problem or control problem. That's another area obviously AI can apply, uh, clearly uh, be very helpful. Thank you, Juno. Uh, my next question will be for, to Michael. Uh, so Nigel Waters, you know, made this comment that sarcasm may be culture and context specific. So it's very hard to determine even probably for AI. So, you know, sarcasm uh, that, you know, in, in, in the UK is very different from what passes off for sarcasm in the US, for instance. So, you know, when you're like doing NLP and trying to get sentiment analysis of the various Twitter posts on, you know, the on public transit, good or bad, uh, how does your model, you know, cope with this sort of different global uh, context of sarcasm and, and other, you know, traits, behavioral traits? Thank you. Yeah, that, that's that's a great question. Um, thanks, and and that's 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 something that we've been we've been asking for quite some time. I mean, currently the way that we determine uh, whether something is sarcastic is whether there is any a contradiction, whether it's a model of the text, whether there is an irony inside. Did someone say something and something else in in the same uh, in the same tweet or or the same sentence? And an irony is something that is pretty universal across everything that that is um, that is sarcastic, right? So if you see that tweet, for example, I had a great start to my morning when the train was dirty, right? That does that, that does not make sense, right? Uh, in terms of lo um, local specific. Um, Cap captions, we're uh, lo local specific um, expressions, for example, right? When we customize models to different agent areas, we can pick up a lot of these. Uh, we should be you know, able to pick up um, pick up a lot of these colloquial languages based on based based on the context of the area. But that has to be something that you tune for every um, every every single area. So right now, this model only works. Um, I would say it works in, in in DC, and it can be, and it can be generalized to other places in terms of raw. But but then that that local context is what you miss. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so another question would be, uh, I guess, on uh, AI and uh, dynamic routing. So uh, you know, uh, Mitch Erickson has this question on what happens when we take the cost of driver out of public transportation. You know, if you have autonomous, you know, smaller shuttles running. Uh, with fewer individual dynamically routed vehicles uh, so how does ai play a role in optimizing this and is this is this a method you know to address the algorithmic fairness to get transit into areas where uh, public transit is currently lacking in certain areas of say chicago or boston for instance uh, to so can we see ai playing a larger role here in ensuring a, a, a better uh, transit reach in cities good thank, thank you so uh, here i have to say that uh... Uh, AI per se doesn't guarantee a value judgment, right? Uh, it, you can use AI to offer a very equitable service. Uh, you can also use AI 
to ensure equity as what uh, Yunhan just demonstrated. You can inf enforce uh, equity constraint. Uh, and also we, we illustrate that sometimes you have to pay a price on efficiency. But uh, let's be explicit about it. If we're serious about equity, that's the amount of efficiency we're willing to suffer in this, right? So here are to say that uh, AI application per se, uh, related to my initial point about this alignment problem, right? Uh, of course, the routing, transit uh, uh, management, on-demand services is our demand. But this is a generic question, right? The biggest problem today in AI field in general is the alignment problem, is how do you align this capacity that we demonstrate growing up and up every day with the human reality, right? So transit is actually a good example to illustrate because there's so much attention attached to this field uh, between efficiency and uh, uh, this equity. Uh, between the public sector and the private sector. Xinhao mentioned at the beginning, if you look at, uh, 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 suppose MIT develop a advanced prediction algorithm or control algorithm, right? A uh, worker can read the paper, one week later, implement it, right? Can MBTA do that, right? So that's clear a gap between both the innovation capacity of AI, but also the implementation capacity. So therefore, I feel like MIT as a research institution, we have a duty to balance the two. So that's why we, we emphasize quite a bit of application in the public transit sector so that we enough knowledge for the two field to more, more kind of a balance uh, uh, in that. Um, One more thing I also I, want to add about uh, the autonomous driving, right? For that, I think if we really discuss the public transit sector, the key question is uh, uh, the, oh, what do I do as a driver, right? Uh, there's a create labor union issue and a future job issue. For that, we have a separate line of research looking at uh, what's the uh, definition of the bus driver may evolve into the future. For now, being a bus driver, what you do is uh, navigate to the vehicle, right? But with the automated bus system coming, the job may be less about navigating the vehicle, but is to interact with the passengers. Right, to have a good experience with the passengers. Particularly in today's public transit system, we have homeless, violence, mental health people, et cetera. Those are a new requirement of the bus driver that need to deal with, right? So bus driver is not that being replaced, their job will need to be redefined. Yeah, I think uh, the, the bus driver currently is juggling so many multiple duties, their task is so tough. Um, AI may make that task a bit easier by, you know, taking some of the attention from the driving bit to other aspects of, you know, running the bus service. So that's a great point, you know. Uh, so, so John mentioned this bit, you know, uh, about, you know, how, how likely it is that transit authorities can, you know, actually adopt some of these technologies. Uh, so, you know, my question is, uh, probably to Joseph as well, you know, you did the pilot for, for one week on Route 81. And there were there were good results. So is is CTA you know uh, extending this technology to other routes as well, uh, because you know there is there is a dire need to you know uh, in, do better predictions and you know reduce headways in certain places. I took the green line on Wednesday night, and there, this was at 10 p.m. when both the Red Sox and the Celtics games had ended. And I can tell you, my transit time took twice as long, and the there was not even standing room in the green line to head back to government center. So. There is, I mean, the, the, like John mentioned, these are things which everybody knows that the game ends at 9.30, but can we run more green line service, you know, towards government center or Park Street? But we are, you know, transit authorities are struggling to even do the simple rule-based uh, optimization. So how probable is it that, you know, the AI-based optimization is implemented on a large scale, you know, in, in, the, in the near term? Yeah, if I could jump in on this, there's definitely an appetite on the side of Chicago to... Uh, extend this to a decision support tool that they can use in multiple routes. And But I would argue that AI would come in at the point where decisions that are currently made by different people, different groups of people, like different strategies, such as altering the departures or short-turning a bus or expressing, they're all um, reliant on the intuition of several non-coordinating human staff. And so the potential of AI is to bring in this information together and sharing a platform where the decisions can be a bit more coordinated. I also want to add that uh, uh, in terms of the big organization, their response to AI in general and uh, this large language model in specific. Let me give you one example. I was uh, in Spain, we're talking to one of the corporation. They really are in a, in a dilemma. Uh, what they told me is uh, if my company do not engage with uh, chat GDP or equivalent, uh, my competitors may engage them, have higher productivity, 
that I mean very quickly, right? Particularly for this mundane business processing stuff, right? But if I do engage, then whatever of my own domain specific knowledge will be absorbed into this general model, right? The first week it helped me, the second week it helped me, the third week it become me, right? So how to protect my intellectual property, particularly the domain knowledge of this, right? I think this is actually a, a generic problem many of these old corporations are facing today. Super, just in the last uh, two minutes, um, I'd like to turn the conversation back to you, Genoa. We've talked about technology, and of course, you and your lab looks a lot of technology, but you also look at human behavior. And so I'd like to just close with any reflections you may have about the behavioral dimension. You know, how, what have you learned about nudging people toward public transportation? Um, you know, this ID that I have on the back, it has free access, free quote for MIT staff to use the local MBTA system here. Do you see more of those types of programs that are about, you know, people and institutions? Let's put technology aside. What observations do you have? Sure. Oh, thank, thank you for, for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, my lab has kind of a two kind of prongs. One is this uh, computational angle using this uh, technology, using AI. The other one is the behavior angle. You try to have a more in-depth humanistic understanding of why people move, what motivates people. Right. So thank you for, for, for actually prompting that question. And then uh, let, me, let me offer a, like a behavior perspective of AI. Actually, the two are not separate things. First of all, how AI is being applied in influencing people's behavior. Then secondly, how behavior can help improve AIs, right? The first one, how AI applied to influence behavior. For that, uh, uh, social media companies uh, are, are, the, are the kind of brilliant applicant of those things. They hire the best computer scientists, best psychologists with a single purpose for you get addicted to the social media. That's a clearly behavior intervention, right? But the other side, of course, you can use this in a very positive way, right? You can use this computation tool to empower many of the behavior inside we have, but just not to do more social media instead to use more, say, sustainable travel, use bicycle, walking, and public trends. That's one aspect. The other aspect is I also have to say that the behavior understanding can also help us improve AI, right? That's where, for example, MIT, the cognitive science and brain science department are working very closely with the computer science department. The two fields are really mutually helping and benefiting each other. So many of the, uh, the AI experts, actually, when they develop AI, some of the for application purpose, some of them, the intention is by building AI, I can understand the brain better. Right. So that's a very different perspective on this. Overall, as you introduced at the beginning, my lab is you try to bring the behavior thinking and computation of thinking together in order to, to decarbonize the mobility system. Excellent. Okay. And with that, we will close today's session. Thank you all so much. Thank you to, to Jinwa, to all the, the great presentations from the, the students. Let's end with a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>